All right. So I'm going to. All right. So welcome everybody to the last course in the 2023 series or 2022 series online Parkinson's school. I'm obviously all ready for next year. Um, what we're going to do today is kind of recap a little bit of what we've done over the course of the year, but this is a topic that is becoming increasingly more important, and that is preventing Parkinson's in the next generation. Um, as we kind of talked about last week, when you're in it, you're in it, and it's hard to get perspective. And my goal here today is not to give the, my attention to those of you who I've given attention to for the rest of the year. This isn't really about the people with Parkinson's. It's about your children and your partners and your loved ones who, who have not yet been diagnosed, who might already have it. And my ideas about what the next generation of Parkinson's needs to look like. like. So this is a pretty popular um, chart. This was published a couple years ago, but this is what we now think of as being the diagnostic part of point for Parkinson's disease. For somewhere between five and 25 years prior to diagnosis, people already have all kinds of symptoms, loss of smell, acting out your dreams, erectile dysfunction, constipation. And people have these symptoms for years before they get a diagnosis. Our reality, our conversation, our fear, our responsibility all starts right here. And what today's conversation is about is there we are wasting time. There is a missed opportunity. There are millions of people in this world right now who already have Parkinson's disease and they don't know it. And they won't know it until the disease progresses enough for them to get some motor symptoms and a diagnosis. Here is the, um, this is the, my pro PD scale that we've been talking about and using for this study. You know, this is the figure I've been showing you now for a couple of years, showing that the average person has a score of about 550, 600 at diagnosis. And that goes up at about 40 points a year. So that the average person gets about 10 good years for Parkinson's. That's great. That's what we've been talking about. We've been spent this whole last couple of years talking about how to flatten the slope. But what I really want to do is zoom out and realize how many years prior to onset this is already taking place. And so, you know, we, uh, many of you have read um, the book, The End of Parkinson's Disease, which is a fabulous book. And those same authors wrote a paper for the Scientist magazine on the rise of Parkinson's. And you know, when we look at even Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, brain cancer, epilepsy, the other neurologic disorders are not going up the way Parkinson's is going up. There really is a Parkinson's pandemic that is predicted. Um, we are expected, I believe it's the next slide, um, that there um, we will double the number of people diagnosed with Parkinson's by the year 2040. And so so it is really easy for us all to think of, I have Parkinson's, he does not. But what I want you to leave here thinking is when you look around the room at a whole bunch of your friends and family members who don't have a diagnosis of Parkinson's, there is a chance one of them has it. And I want us to start thinking like that. Like we have a responsibility that starts long before diagnosis. Um, this was covered in the old classes. I just want to restate that these words are kind of all lumped together, but they mean different things. Preventing a disease is different than the screening methods that we use to go and find people who might have it. How we assess and size up risk, your likelihood of getting it. Is it twice average? Is it four times average? Is it 40 times average? How we determine risk. Certainly how we go about early detection and early intervention. And so this is a package deal, you have to do them all, but they're very intertwined. This visual lays out the importance of getting started early. If you were to start, this is real data, this black line. If you were the day of diagnosis to change your behavior or take some medicine or do something that allowed you a 50% reduction in slope, this is what that would look like. Instead of your quality of life being poor 25 years from now, it means your quality of life is fair 25 years from now. Great, I'll take it. It's better than nothing, but it's not good enough. That same 50% reduction in slope, if we could actually get to your children, your loved ones, your sisters, your brothers, 
before they have a diagnosis and identify them and they get that same 50% reduction, that means that they're living 45 years and still in the good zone. The, the rate, at, with the impact that we can have the earlier we get this is profound. So you've heard me talk lots about, you know, how this is the data that we know. This is kind of what we're trying to predict is the rate of progression. And I want to show you, this is starting the day of diagnosis, what an 80% reduction in slope looks like. If you wait five years before you reduce the slope, here's what that looks like. And if you wait 10 years, here's what that looks like. So there are two components here. How much do you slow progression and how quickly do you get to it? Because you can get a 40% reduction 10 years prior to diagnosis is more substantial than an 80% reduction if you wait, if you start the day of diagnosis. You don't have to work that hard if you get started early. This is a complete and utter failure of public health. We have failed you. We are failing your children and your loved ones who have not yet been diagnosed. We know that early in the disease, these folks have loss of smell, they're acting out their dreams, they have disrupted sleep, muscle pain, erectile dysfunction, bowel issues. People with IBS are more likely to get Parkinson's disease, let alone IBD or Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Anxiety, depression, fatigue, apathy, those can be early symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Why are primary care providers not screening this? Why are there not milk curtains, huh? the irony. <laughs> Why are there not public health um, announcements kind of saying, do you have any of these things? At the last World Parkinson Congress, I, um, I helped out this company had um, little coffee cup holders that said, can you smell this? If you can't, talk to your doctor. Brilliant. Cool. How hard would that be to just ask coffee shops to start adding things like that? If you can't if you can't smell this cup of coffee, talk to your doc. That could be an early Parkinson's warning. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about what we do for the people who get, you know, might be these folks. Um, and just for perspective, you know, I'm talking about what it would take to slow Parkinson's progression by 40% or 80%. I just want to make sure that I remind everybody that our data says very clearly that people who do 30 minutes of exercise six to seven days a week have a 50% slower rate of progression. I mean, if the younger generation, the non-diagnosed would just do 30 minutes of exercise six to seven days a week, could that change the course of their yet undiagnosed disease? Those are the research questions for the next generation and where I think this is truly headed. Um, in terms of screening test, you know, I, I don't know that there's a, there are a couple of new exciting things happening. I don't know that they're new in the last year, but we didn't talk about them very thoroughly in last videos, but um, uh, I think this is in Australia. There is a um, keyboard based typing. They're not really looking so much for the speed of typing, but a rhythm to your typing. And you can sign up to be part of this study for home-based detection and monitoring of Parkinson's disease. Um, I think they said several tens of thousands of people have already done it. Um, but it's a free, easy, kind of cheap assessment tool at, that we could be using more often. So I'm glad this is being studied. This is kind of where I think the future of screening tests is going. I tried to do this myself, but um, I'm too young. Um, the birth year started with 19... 70, it was like three or four years before I was born was the youngest that you could do it. And so I, I can't tell you what the experience is like playing with the keyboard. I didn't want to mess up their data and lie about my birth year. Um, but this would be an easy way to contribute to research that would help the next generation. Um, similarly, um, there is a voice screening app that is all artificial intelligence bait driven where you call and you talk into a voice recorder, you repeat Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And based on the cadence and rhythm and intonation and volume of your voice, an artificial intelligence program can detect Parkin differentiate Parkinson's from not Parkinson's. Obviously that's not enough to give somebody a diagnosis, but it is enough to alert them 
to what might be an early, help them get the diagnosis a little bit earlier, alert them that they might be on the track to develop Parkinson's or be diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, moving away from screening and into early detection, I'm kind of putting the two, the, the three things that are coming are um, skin biopsies are already here. Their usefulness we talked about last year, we talked about some of the pros and cons. Um, that is a skin biopsy. I don't know the price tag on it. I want to say it's a little over a thousand dollars but you get a biopsy of the back of the neck, the thigh and the calf, I believe, or maybe it's torso and leg, um, but you send in three skin biopsies and we can actually measure the amount of misfolded alpha-synuclein aggregation in the skin. And um, unfortunately you don't get a black or white, yes or no, true or false sort of thing. It's kind of a very spectrumy gray area of, oh, the neck had lots of misfolded alpha-synuclein, the torso had a little bit and the leg was in the middle. And so while it's exciting and um, the, the way the researchers are going about it is really top notch, um, the, the results are a little fuzzy and hard to interpret. And we actually don't know if people who are positive, what kind of neurodegenerative disease they're going to go on to. Um, it could be a dementia-based disease. It could be a, a Parkinson's disease. And so um, the diseases associated with alpha-synucleinopathies, um, it, it doesn't specifically ID Parkinson's. But this is, this is probably the one that will make it to prime time, be adopted the fastest, my, is my guess. Um, and then there are a couple sets of dogs. There are three of them. Um, the two dogs that I have are the Park Nine, and the other two groups have been more productive. Um, very exciting. I think this was in September of this year. Movement Disorders is the premier journal of our Parkinson's disease community. Um, it is the highest ranking, highest impact factor journal covering and addressing Parkinson's disease. And it is the official journal of the Movement Disorder Society. And it was really exciting to see a couple months ago that their cover story were, was on dogs detecting Parkinson's disease. And so this was a group based in China. And what they concluded was that um, tests using sniffer dogs may be a useful, non-invasive, fast, and cost-effective method to identify patients with Parkinson's disease in community screening and health prevention checkups, as well as in neurological practice. So I, that's exciting that that's being done. I do want to point out every, um, very often you all ask me, how, how is my dog detection project coming? And I just want to point out the size of the team that just did the other dog detection, the sniffer dog study out of China. This is the size of the team that made that happen. And so um, beside, between their funding and the size of their team, they're obviously moving a little bit faster than what my research has been doing or the PADS group. Um, the other group that is doing scent detection stuff is here in Washington State in the San Juan Islands. Um, fabulous, one of my favorite places. Um, they have a whole bunch of dogs who show up every afternoon and volunteer their time. And they have a fabulous dog trainer who really knows her stuff. And um, they are have been taking samples and giving people results now for a while, over a year or so. And you can sign up to become a sample donor and they'll send you a kit and a t-shirt and a thermos and you sleep in the t-shirt overnight. And then you put it in this airtight thermos and send it in and um, they'll have six or seven dogs go up and down the track saying yes, yes, no, no, yes, whether or not you have the scent of Parkinson's disease. And so they're using t-shirts. Um, in our in our system, we don't use t-shirts. I use dirt Q-tips from and samples from the inside of people's ears. Um, a little bit of it is earwax, a little bit of it is skin cells, some of it is the dermal microbiome, and we're all probably ultimately talking about sebum, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, there's a two minute video, if anybody wants to watch how the dogs detect Parkinson's, I can show you when we're done here. Um, but because dogs get sick and require feeding and love and attention and walks, they are not quite as easy to work with as a machine that can be calibrated. And so based on the work that has been being done by both 
the different dogs and the woman in Scotland, Joy Milne, who can smell Parkinson's disease. They have been working on a, uh, a technological device called mass, mass spectrometry, where you can put a sample into a machine and it will spit out, here are all the molecules that we found in that sample. So it's great. The medical community is pretty, ex um, likes, um, data, numbers, quantified molecules, more than they like a dog saying yes or no, right? The, the, the scientific community is just more comfortable with mass spec. Um, and so I'm glad that that is happening. It's not ready for prime time yet. What they do is they take Joy Milne, the woman who can smell Parkinson's, says that the scent is strongest at the nape of the neck. Um, so that's where they take swabs from. Um, the problem here is that when you take a swab from the back of somebody's neck, they have found there are over 4,000 different chemicals in that sample, and over 500 of them are statistically different between Parkinson's and healthy controls. So philosophically, you know, this is just one of the differences between, like, it, there's no right or wrong. We have to do it all. Um, ultimately, we all do want to know what is it that's different. but it is my personal opinion that I don't think that these 500 samples that are, these molecules that are different are necessarily what is causing Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, I think that once you have Parkinson's, all kinds of metabolic shifts start to happen. And my fear is that we're going to spend a ton of time and money trying to chase the molecule only to find out the molecule itself isn't the problem. It's just a downstream consequence of the problem. And, and so I'm putting my investment in the simple, crude, early dog thing where I don't really care what they're smelling. I just need to know yes or no, do you have the scent? As soon as I have the scent, I'm going to start telling you to eat more vegetables and do more exercise. So this question about sebum, um, there are tons of, so sebum is this oily, waxy substance produced by the skin. It has a lot of fats in it, um, but it has other micro metabolites other than just um, fats. And it's not just our metabolites, but it also has the metabolites of the organisms that live on our skin. And there are tons of things. I mean, if you've ever looked in it, this is a dust mite because I couldn't find a picture of the mites that live on our skin but it's easily Googleable. but mites that look just like this are living all over our faces and eating the sebum. And so, you know, when, when we take samples, we are taking samples of the organisms that live on us, we're taking skin samples, we're taking fat samples and this oily substance called sebum. And so you have glands underneath that make it, but we do know that that seems to be different in Parkinson's. The, the type of secretions you make, the thickness of them, the composition of them, and the scent of them is different. So um, for those of you who are worrying about the scent, it, it's not a stinky scent. It doesn't smell bad. It's been described as wet leaves in the fall, maybe a little bit like soil. Um, I wouldn't call it a bad scent, but it is a distinct scent. And so, um, and, and Joy Milne is not the only person who can smell it. I, I can smell it a little bit. I've had lots of patients over the time. If I've, um, pre-COVID, when I used to see a lot of patients in office, after I've had 10 or 12, 15 patients in my office for a day, for the day, it, it would actually be kind of easy to come into my room at the end of the day and still kind of have a little bit of that scent lingering. So it, it's, it's not, um, it's not offensive, it's not bad, but it's there. And so that's kind of what we're chasing when we're trying to say, can we get to these people early? It's the typing, it's the speech, but maybe the dogs can help us alert to these people early. So again, this is just how these sebaceous glands make sebum and it comes out of hair follicles. So this is kind of where the attention is going, both these skin biopsies and a sebum is where kind of these next generation or first generation tools for um, screening for Parkinson's are focusing on. Um, in terms of rating scales, it's one thing to know that you may have the scent of Parkinsonism or have a skin biopsy that's positive or a typing pattern that puts you at increased risk. Um, once you're there, we still need to be able to track it, study it, know if we're helping, have some way to monitor it. And so I don't, right now, um, the UPDRS and the Honin-Yar and all of those rating tests that we use in clinic 
don't aren't useful to a person who hasn't been diagnosed, right? Because so many of them are made based on motor symptoms. By definition, you don't have those motor symptoms that early in the disease. So, so we need a better scale to measure early. Um, we can tell you, like I, I think I have it on here. Like, so here's my score, my years, my part pro PD score from a couple of days ago. I had a 38, I think. And so, you know, statistically, I can say starting where I am right now, if I were to have Parkinson's and progress at the rate of a typical person with Parkinson's, I've got about 15 to 18 years before I would have enough symptoms to warrant a diagnosis. So we can mathematically start to say things like that, but I don't know if it's meaningful, right? You know, because what we're saying is the average person progresses at a certain rate here. I don't know that that's meaningful to you because you're not average, you know? And so I don't know if that's empowering to people or scary to people, but mathematically we can start to make those predictions. Um, this was um, my, me talking about how, for how many years I've been trying to kind of build this, this approach to Parkinson's disease. And this is kind of how I'm thinking about it, where, you know, what, what, you know, the way that we screen for colon cancer or prostate cancer or breast cancer, where you get a mammogram every couple of years or a screening colonoscopy when you turn 50, I am imagining a website where you can go and check a couple of boxes. Are you over the age of 40? Have you lost your sense of smell? Is your handwriting getting smaller or sloppier? Are you fatigued? Do you have erectile function? You know, check, check. If you have more than three of these six symptoms, do a test, do a voice test, the typing test, the dog scent test. But if you have enough positive symptoms to raise your eyebrows, especially some of the very characteristic ones like acting out your dreams and constipation and loss of smell. I believe the numbers, don't quote me on this, but I think it's something like 80 some percent. If you have loss of smell, acting out your dreams, dreams, REM sleep behavior disorder, and constipation, I think it's like an 80% likelihood that you'll be diagnosed with Parkinson's in the next several years. I don't, I don't exactly remember the number right now, but it's high. So if you have some of these characteristic symptoms, the dogs just identify you as having a scent of Parkinson's or one of these skin biopsies or something like that, then we dive into disease modification. And obviously there aren't drugs to slow Parkinson's disease right now. So we're not really talking about a drug, but we are talking about, you know, let's get educated. Let's watch this school. Let's watch these series. Let's get a little bit more well-informed about who does well and who doesn't with Parkinson's. Maybe you should get your hair test, your blood test, check your homocysteine levels, check your B12 and your vitamin D levels. Not once you have Parkinson's, but once you know that you're at increased risk. Are there some supplements you should be taking? Maybe I would probably start if, if a dog or a skin test told me I had the scent of Parkinson's, I would definitely start taking coenzyme Q10 and glutathione and NAD and fish oil and vitamin D and cover a couple of those bases. And that would also identify these people would also allow us to open a whole new door to research, right? We have to, at the end of the day, start studying these people who have pre prodromal Parkinson's and asking a question, can we stop it? Can we slow it? Can we decrease the likelihood that this person who was detected early is ever diagnosed? But until we can identify these people, we can't even do that research. So um, I'll just point out, this is something I've been working on since 2017, and um, I'm moving it forward as quickly as I can, but this is so slow. Um, I want to jump into a little tougher conversation that I, I've kind of alluded to and my personality may have kind of brought it up along the way, but I, I think that we just need to approach head on some of the tough conversations about food psychiatry. Um, it is not, so it's a way easier just to take two pills and call me in the morning than it is to change what you eat, change your habits, change your cultural preferences. Um, I've had a neurologist here in town say to me, we were talking about the data on, on diet and neurologic disease, MS in particular. And this neurologist said to me, my patients have already lost so much. I'm not going to take away their cheeseburgers and milkshakes too. Um, I saw a patient 
you know, so so I just want to say there there are so many different approaches to how we approach food. Some people are quick. I've had a patient say, hey, if there's any chance this will slow progression, just tell me what to do. I'll do it. I have other people who go kicking and screaming saying, no, no, make I'll make one change, but that's it. I'm going to keep doing everything the same because that's who I am. That's what I like. That's what I want. And so I just want to say this is so much more complicated than pills. Um, the other thing that is a very difficult um, topic to address, and it's one of the criticisms about um, the type of medicine I practice where, where I, I try to perpetuate this idea that you have control over your outcomes. You can control what happens from here on out. If you follow that linking through, if we believe that diet and behavior can affect progression and diet and behavior can affect risk, we must therefore conclude accidentally or not that things that we did in our life got us to the situation. And there is a fine line between making, having a patient walk away feeling guilty, having a parent or a loved one feeling guilty that they didn't know they didn't do more to prevent this and taking responsibility and ultimately feeling empowered. And that is a delicate, those are delicate lines to dance between and they're not exclusive, but I think we have to ask some of the hard questions. Probably the hardest question I've had to answer for myself, for you, for my children is, are we poisoning ourselves? You know, that's a dramatic word that sounds shocking, but what I wanna know is, are we giving something to ourselves, exposing ourselves to something and our loved ones and our children that is slowly, that is over time causing more damage than we realize? There are a whole bunch of ways to talk to your kids, right? And I do wanna, I, and I'm, whether your kids are four or 44 right now, I, I, this is kind of all relevant. You have to adjust the message for the age of the person and the kid. If I tell my eight-year-old, you shouldn't eat that because the literature says consumption increases your risk of Parkinson's disease. They don't hear that. That means nothing. If you say, oh, it tastes good, but it rots your brain over time. They get that, you know? And so I am trying to help you come up with creative ways to communicate to your family who doesn't have a diagnosis, how, how they might be able to prevent one. What if the things that we enjoy are part of the problem? There's no question that um, many people not just kids, but many people have been trained to like a certain taste, highly processed, salty, sugary, refined, almost drug-like food. We'll get to that in a minute, but it is, it is not always an easy transition to go from Big Macs and Mountain Dew over to Brussels sprouts and farro, right? And so that is not always an easy transition to make? Um, what if your favorite food is on the bad list? What if you are motivated to change your diet, but your family isn't? And, and this is where I really start talking about, um, you know, my response to that is, is that's when you have to sit down and have a conversation with your kids where we're not just doing this for me, we're doing this for you, right? When people say to me, I can't eat this way because I have four teenagers. They'll never, they'll only eat cheeseburgers and pizza for dinner. They'll never eat vegetables. I'm not really so much even worried about the patient of mine who has to learn how to navigate meals in an unsupportive family. I am more concerned about their four teenagers who are chipping away at, at disease enhancing behaviors and nobody is intervening. What if we are addicted to the things that are hurting us? Um, there is a, a big study came out just last month, um, or the first week in November, a big study was released out of University of Michigan that said, we can now say that processed foods have all of the addictive properties of nicotine. Oof. In terms of the addictive potential, processed foods, um, 
the addictive potential for food such as potato chips, cookies, ice cream, and French fries may be a key factor in contributing to the high public health costs associated with food environment dominated by cheap, accessible, and heavy marketed, heavily marketed, highly processed foods. The processed foods trigger compulsive use where people are unable to quit or cut down. How many of you have not been able to put down a bag of chips or snacks, right? Even in the face of life-threatening diseases like diabetes or heart disease or Parkinson's, these foods can change the way we feel and cause changes in the brain that are similar magnitude to nicotine and tobacco products. They are highly reinforcing and they trigger intense urges and cravings. You know, Medscape picked it up. Food addiction explains so much of what we see in clinical practice, where intelligent people understand what we tell them about the physiology associated with, in this case, it was a low carb diet, and they follow it for a while, but then they relapse, explaining the difficulties faced by about 20% of her patients who she considers to have a food addiction. So, so we have to start get kind of pulling off the Band-Aid and looking at the situation and starting to acknowledge, acknowledge that, that we all have habits that are not, it's, it's not food. There is a point where it becomes a drug. If your body likes how it makes you feel, but it's hurting you, it's not food, it's not nourishment, it's a drug. And I want you to start differentiating food that nourishes you, that food you're eating because you like the thrill of it. You like how it makes you feel, but it's hurt even if you know it's not good for you. And those are really big distinctions to get in the habits of making. Um, I am not suggesting that my way is best, but I am a mom of two kids and I want to use myself as an example for, for kind of how I've done it. I, I think there are many ways to do it better and worse than I've done it, but I'm giving, I'd like to toss out some ideas for how to bring some of these principles home. Um, as I just said, processed food is the new tobacco. I'm pretty sure we all have some relative, neighbor, friend from a couple generations back who we can remember sitting around the kitchen table chain smoking. Um, you know, we, we all, know, we grew up, so many of us grew up with cigarette smoke being not that bad, right? And so we, this is the new processed food is the new tobacco, and this has become us. And instead of us offering our kids a cigarette, what we are doing is offering them processed foods, cheeseburgers, milkshakes, pizzas, and, and it's bonding, it's family time. And I do want to say that I think that Parkinson's prevention starts when your kids are babies and it's not too late. I mean, if they're 50 years old, it's not too late, but I do want you to be aware when you are sharing intimate family time, food connects us. Food is one of the most historical ritualistic ways to come together, to bring people together through history. What I would like you to do is be aware of, of when you are using, it, it is possible to bond and have these intimate moments and connection without drug dealing, without giving our kids something that is going to hurt them, that is going to reinforce addictive behavior. Just because they like it, just because it makes them happy, doesn't mean we need to give it to them. Be the adult, be the role model. Your job is to teach the next generation self-care, self-respect standards and show them what it looks like to nourish themselves. We all have, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I can remember the first time one of my friends, the first time I met somebody who was a vegetarian or a vegan, it was so odd. First time I met somebody who didn't drink alcohol right? Like, wow, that, that, what a life altering thing. And then it starts to normalize. And then you start realizing as you get older and wiser, oh, you know, like maybe that makes a little more sense, you know, and you, you start to normalize it. You might be the first person in your family to say, you know what, I'm going to go more plant-based. I'm going to eat more fruits and vegetables. You may be the first, but I do promise you, it's just a matter of time before your other friends and family members start coming around to you saying, Hey, listen, I'm now taking interest in some of those things that you started a couple years back. Can you show me the way? It just happens like that. 
Um, we all have tons of reasons as to why it's, we don't want to kind of bring the things that you're all personally working on home to our families. They don't like those foods. They won't eat anything else. We all know kids who won't eat anything except mac and cheese and string cheese and goldfish. Um, certainly processed food is cheaper, faster, and easier. Cooking whole foods requires so much more time and preparation and chopping and things like that. And frankly, many of us have never learned to cook. I, 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 you know, I've been studying nutrition for 25 years and I still struggle with what do I, what do I have? If that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. How do I turn fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds into a really nice meal? And those are, that's a challenge. And, and it's just, nobody ever taught me to do that. And now with all of you, we're learning how to eat. Um, in terms of my house, you know, your ground rules are gonna be different than mine, but I just kind of wanna show you that I have layers. Like we don't bring anything in this house that has artificial colors and flavors. You could go through every cupboard and drawer in our house. You would not find anything with aspartame, no gum, no diet stuff. And we try to get organic where possible. You know, health, healthy junk food, in quotes, you know, things like, you know, processed Trader Joe's snacks and things like that are, are there. You'll find them. It's probably about 20% of our diet. But there are a couple of things where I just don't want them in the house. We just don't eat them. I'm pretty flexible about most things, but there are some lines I won't cross. Um, not because I think wheat and dairy are the worst things in the world. Um, but because I see too many, the, the most critical period for a child's brain development, for a human's brain development, are those first two years. Something like 80% of the brain is done growing by, you know, year two or something like that. It's probably even more than that. Um, and so what I saw when I looked around were a whole bunch of parents raising their children on goldfish and string cheese and mac and cheese. And it's not that wheat and cheese are horrible. But what's happening is those foods are one, contaminating the taste buds and drugging the kids and making it so that other foods don't taste as good. And two, those foods are taking up space without providing much nutritional value. And so for the first two years of my kid's life, the rule was we don't bring wheat and dairy in the house, right? And it wasn't because they're bad. It's because we needed to force ourselves to feed them nutrient dense meals. When you take away the cheap, fast, processed crap, you have to invest more in, you know, apple and peanut butter and raisins on celery with cashew butter. And those are the type of snacks you turn to. And so it was a way for us to keep our standards higher about nutritional density during this very, very critical period. Um, I'm a big fan of teaching, not insisting. I don't make my kids do anything. I teach them. I expose them. I expand their palate. You know, Thai food, Ethiopian food, Japanese food, Peruvian food. You know, we we try really hard to, I, I try really hard to kind of not let them fall into the, the Western diet rut where everything is kind of white. Um, I love it when my kids eat food I don't approve of and feel bad afterwards. I absolutely love rubbing that in and pointing out to them. It's not me that's telling you this is bad. It's now your body telling you that this isn't working for you. And that's a totally different thing. And I'm happy that your body is doing a really good job telling you what it likes and doesn't, right? So I point that kind of stuff out. I'm not above guilt trips. I have absolutely told my kids, go ahead, rot your brain. If you think that ice cream cone is worth you losing a few brain cells, you go for it. Um, and, you know, I love it. They have the ice cream cone. They, I let them, they, you know, but I, in there is a lesson and they're taking inventory and they're learning, you know what? Sometimes it's okay to have a little bit, but this is not a lifestyle I want. This is not something I want to do regularly. Um. And threats and bribery, of course, are always very good tools. And I'm being a little funny about that. But really, I mean, I have absolutely said to my kids, you have a choice. You can fold these five loads of laundry or you can watch the movie, The Game Changers. You know, we play a game at dinner where, you know, over the dinner table, people will, will all add up our points. Here are all your good points. Here are all your bad points. Whoever has the most good points for the day the person who has the fewest points of the day has to do cleanup after dinner. They have to do the dishes. And it doesn't matter. It's not the end of the world. Nobody's in trouble for eating poorly that day. 
But I do want there to be some immediate consequences for bad decision making. They can eat whatever they want, but there are going to be consequences of it. Um, new update since last year, we did a IRB modification. And so this MVP study that many of you are in, thank you, um, is now accepting anybody who might be at increased risk of Parkinson's disease. We have always been studying people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease and all these other forms of Parkinsonism. Um, what is new this year is we have uh, IRB approval to now start studying your children and your loved ones. If you have anybody in your life who considers themselves to have a family history of Parkinson's, has, is carrying a gene, um, early life or current dairy intake, history of head trauma, history of melanoma or skin cancer, known pesticide exposure, history of well water, acting out your dreams, loss of smell, diabetes, irritable bowel syndrome, or constipation. Anybody with any of those symptoms is enough to say you are at increased risk of Parkinson's. You're welcome to come join our study. So for those of you who have partners who may be watching this video, family members who say, how can I help? It would be really nice if they would go to mvpstudy.com and answer about two to three hours a year of questions. It's a one hour to one and a half hour survey twice a year. We send it out. And their enrollment will allow us to start to find these people who have prodromal Parkinson's and start to answer the question, if, if they are there behaviors that they can do now that decrease their risk of being diagnosed over time. That's ultimately what we want. Um, in terms of just this kind of foundational principle, this isn't specific to people who test positive, this is everybody. Right, we already know we we now have 3,000 people in this study. We can see the more you exercise, the slower Parkinson's disease progresses, the more friends a person has, the slower it progresses. People who have a lot of stress and are lonely are progressing faster. You know, we have to be taught, train, teaching our kids it's not a you should exercise, it is you have to. We have to invest in stress management, self-care, daily exercise. I don't care if it's an evening walk after dinner. We have to train the next generation that you have no choice but to use your body some way, somehow, most days. Um, you know, this is the slide that we looked at last week. This is how the data is starting to add up. Um, by mid next year, we will kind of have all of this kind of, um, the size of the font will be proportional to the impact of that intervention. So, you know, the glutathione word font will be hot, larger than the fish oil font because that coincides with the data that we're seeing. Um, I don't think that the people without a diagnosis of Parkinson's need to start taking a bunch of supplements. I do think there's no reason why they can't change their diet to be more mind, Mediterranean, plant-based, whole foods, whatever you want to call it. Um, my advice for every one of you is not only do I want you to stop eating all of these things, I want you to tell your loved ones to stop eating these things and tell your family that if they want to eat it, that's going to have to be when you're outside the house, because this is not healthy food and you don't want to bring it in the house. It's not in your oh, best interest okay. and it's not in your family's best interest. Um, let me do that. Um, and so, you know, here is that same thing. I'll post this on Parkinson's school so that you all have these, um, both of these slides. I'll give you this one. And then this is the 2022 update. We already went over this during the last class. I'm not going to go over it all again, but we do know that the people who are doing the best over time, these are the foods they're eating. And these are the behaviors they say true to. I avoid soda, I avoid dairy, I regularly eat buckwheat and farro, and I try to eat organic, and I'm vegetarian, and I avoid pork, and I use a lot of spices. Like, I want this to become a refrigerator magnet that your kids see every time they open the refrigerator door. I want this to be their truth. I want them to say true to most of these things. It doesn't have to be all of them, but this is what we should be working towards. So this is the summary. I, again, I'm not suggesting these 
so here, here's kind of the order that I would do. I think everybody, no matter who they are, what their risk level should be exercising daily. It doesn't always have to be drip with sweat exercise, but they have to be stretching and pushing and pulling and getting their heart rate up and moving things through them, getting a good night's sleep. Sleep has to be prioritized. Social connection is as important as, as any other medicine that we're taking. Um, there is a whole generation of people who, who are kind of, their friends are via a screen. They don't have those social connections that many of us grew up with. Um, and so kind of helping to facilitate humans connecting and bonding with each other away from screens, I think is really, really important. Obviously, stress management techniques and mindfulness classes and the diet we've already talked about. And then what I would say is, you know, for a person who is an adult, they, they have early symptoms, like say they lost their, they have sense, the uh, diminished sense of smell and they act out their dreams. The dogs said, yes, I would absolutely do a Parkinson's disease blood work panel, a hair test, the same, everything that we've talked about in uh, course number six, what labs should a person with Parkinson's get? I would get those early. I would not wait for a diagnosis. I would kind of consider it. I, I, with my patients, I say it's like taking inventory, finding the cracks in the bottom of a boat. Let's see where we can find deficits and deficiencies and things that can be improved early. Um, and that's that. I mean, I really do think, um, just, just to kind of sum this up, it, I, I really do believe that in the next five years, prodromal Parkinson's disease will be as prevalent and as adopted a concept as Parkinson's disease. It is right around the corner with all of these dogs and swabs and skin biopsies and the recognition that we are getting to it so late. One, there is a community of very passionate researchers who are eager to get to you early and help you early. And there is an entire money-driven industry who can't wait to have a whole new disease population to start to target, right? If we can start targeting prevention and non-motor symptoms. Right now, the only thing Parkinson's industry has are dopamine-based therapies. We can, the only thing pharmaceutical companies and surgery can do are hide the motor symptoms is really what it is best at. Um, there is a whole new world that's going to open up when we start to have therapies that actually can address non-motor symptoms and slow progression. That, that is now millions more people who need help who are not being served by anybody. So with that, I hope that we will all kind of help spread the word and let people know that this is can be detected earlier than people realize. You don't need to sit around and wait for symptoms to get bad enough to get a diagnosis. There are already available dogs and skin biopsies that while not perfect are definitely a step in the right direction and probably more, we already know they're more accurate than not, like something like 85% ability to detect people who have it accurately. Um, so it's here, it's here. We just haven't started using it. And, and I'm going to end this year, um, and my last word before I open it up is that I truly believe that we already have the tools that we need to get to people early and slow and or stop the rate of Parkinson's progression, and we are not using them. We're not waiting for some of this stuff to be invented or discovered. We have it. We're just not using it. No primary care doc has ever said to your children, oh, you're constipated and your mom has Parkinson's disease. We need to keep an eye on that. Let's watch for your sense of, here's a smell test. Let's watch, do, do you act out your dreams? You know, there is reason to believe that some of you had symptoms when you were in high school. Somebody from the videos on here said that in high school, they, they were looking at their, um, their, uh, yearbook where somebody said, you know, the guy who sometimes smiles once in a while or something, you know, we know that in high school, people with Parkinson's skipped less class and joined more clubs and got fewer speeding tickets. I mean, we don't need to wait until you're 60 to identify you and start to help you. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop speaking and open the conversation up to discussion.